The gusher unleashed in the Gulf of Mexico continues to spew crude oil. There are no reliable estimates of how much oil is pouring into the Gulf, but it comes to many millions of gallons since the catastrophic blowout. Eleven men were killed in the explosions that sank one of the most sophisticated drilling rigs in the world, the Deepwater Horizon. This week, Congress continues its investigation, but Congress has not heard from the man you are about to meet. Mike Williams was one of the last crew members to escape the inferno. He says the destruction of the Deepwater Horizon had been building for weeks in a series of mishaps. The night of the disaster, he was in his workshop when he heard the rig's engines suddenly run wild. That was the moment that explosive gas was shooting across the decks, being sucked into the engines that powered the rig's generators. I hear the engines revving. The lights are, are glowing. I'm hearing the alarms. I mean, they're, they're at a constant state now. It's just beep, 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 beep. It, it doesn't stop. But even that's starting to get drowned out by the sound of the engine increasing in speed. And my lights get so incredibly bright that they, they physically explode. Um, I'm, I'm pushing my way back from the desk when my computer monitor exploded. This is the Deepwater Horizon in the hours before its destruction, the night of April 20th. Ironically, the end was coming only months after the rig's greatest achievement. Mike Williams was the chief electronics technician in charge of the rig's computers and electrical systems, and seven months before, he'd helped the crew drill the deepest oil well in history, 35,000 feet. It was special. Uh, there's no way around it. Everyone was talking about it. The congratulations that were flowing around, it just it made you feel proud to work there. Williams worked for the owner, Transocean, the largest offshore drilling company. Like its sister rigs, the Deepwater Horizon cost $350 million, rose 378 feet from bottom to top. Both advanced and safe, none of her 126 crew had been seriously injured in seven years. The safety record was remarkable because offshore drilling today pushes technology with challenges matched only by the space program. Deepwater Horizon was in 5,000 feet of water and would drill another 13,000 feet, a total of three and a half miles. The oil and gas down there are under enormous pressure and the key to keeping that pressure under control is this fluid that drillers call mud. Mud is a man-made drilling fluid that's pumped down the well and back up the sides in continuous circulation. The sheer weight of this fluid keeps the oil and gas down and the well under control. Come on, come on. The tension in every drilling operation is between doing things safely and doing them fast. Time is money, and this job was costing BP a million dollars a day. But Williams says there was trouble from the start getting to the oil was taking too long. How long did you expect it to take? We were told 21 days. How long did it actually take? Uh, we were at six weeks. With the schedule slipping, Williams says a BP manager ordered a faster pace. And he requested to, to the driller, hey, let's bump it up, let's bump it up. And what he was talking about there is he's, he's bumping up the rate of penetration, how fast the drill bit is going down. Williams says going faster caused the bottom of the well to split open swallowing tools and the drilling fluid called mud. We actually got stuck. And we got stuck so bad that we had to send tools down into the drill pipe and sever the pipe. That well was abandoned. Deepwater Horizon had to drill a new route to the oil. It cost BP more than two weeks and millions of dollars. We were informed of this during one of the safety meetings that somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million was lost in bottom hole assembly in mud. And you always kind of knew that in the back of your mind when they start throwing these big numbers around that th there was going to be a push coming, you know, a push to, to, to pick up production, pick up the pace. There was pressure on the crew after this happened? There's always pressure, but yes, the pressure was increased. But the trouble was just beginning. When drilling resumed, Williams says there was an accident on the rig that has not been reported before. He says four weeks before the explosion, the rig's most vital piece of safety equipment was damaged. Down near the seabed is the blowout preventer, or BOP. It's used to seal the well shut, 
In order to test the pressure and integrity of the well, and in case of a blowout, it's the crew's only hope. A key component is a rubber gasket at the top called an annular, which can close tightly around the drill pipe. Williams says that during a test, they closed the gasket, but while it was shut tight, a crewman on deck accidentally nudged a joystick, applying hundreds of thousands of pounds of force and moving 15 feet of drill pipe through the closed blowout preventer. Later, a man monitoring drilling fluid rising to the top made a troubling find. They discovered chunks of rubber in, this, in the drilling fluid. He thought it was important enough to gather this double handful of chunks of rubber and bring them into the driller shack. I recall asking the, the supervisor if this was out of the ordinary. It's just, it's no big deal. And I thought, how, how can it be not a big deal? There's, there's chunks of our seal is now missing. And Williams says he knew about another problem with the blowout preventer. The BOP is operated from the surface by wires connected to two control pods. One is a backup. Williams says that one of the pods lost some of its function weeks before. Transocean tells us the BOP was tested by remote control after these incidents and passed. But nearly a mile below, there was no way to know how much damage there was or why the pod seemed unreliable. In the hours before the disaster, Deepwater Horizon's work was nearly done. All that was left was to seal the well closed. The oil would be pumped out by another rig later. Williams says that during a safety meeting, the manager for the rig owner, Transocean, was explaining how they were going to close the well when the manager from BP interrupted. I had the, the BP company man sitting directly beside me and he he literally perked up and said well my my process is different and I think we're gonna do it this way and they, they kind of lined out the way he thought it should go that day so there was sort of a, a chest bumping kind of deal the communication seemed to really break down as to who was ultimately in charge the day of the accident BP flew several managers to the Deepwater Horizon for a ceremony to congratulate the crew for seven years without an injury. While they were there, a surge of explosive gas came flying up the well from three miles below. The rig's diesel engines, which power its electric generators, sucked in the gas and began to run wild. I'm hearing hissing, the engines are over revving, and then all of a sudden all the lights in my shop just started getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And I knew, I knew then we were, something bad was getting ready to happen. It was almost 10 at night, and directly under the deep water horizon were four men in a fishing boat. Albert Andre, Dustin King, Ryan Chasen, and Wesley Borg. When I heard the gas coming out, I knew exactly what it was almost immediately. When the gas cloud was descending on you, what was that like? It was, it was scary. And when I looked at it, it burned my eyes, and I, I, I knew I, we had to get out of there. You could tell what it was? I knew it was methane. On the rig, Mike Williams was reaching for a door to investigate the engine noise. These are three-inch thick steel fire-rated doors with six stainless steel hinges supporting them on the frame. As I reached for the handle, I heard this awful hissing noise, this whoosh, and at the height of the hiss, a huge explosion. The explosion literally rips the door from the hinges. Hits, impacts me and takes me to the other side of the shop. And I'm up against the wall when I finally come around with a door on top of me. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this, this is it. I'm gonna die right here. The men on the fishing boat had a camera. Look at the water on fire. I began to, to crawl across the floor. As I got to the next door, it exploded and took me, the door, and slid me about 35 feet backwards again and planted me up against another wall. At that point, I actually got angry. I was mad at the doors. I was mad that these, these fire doors that are supposed to protect me are hurting me. And at that point, I, I made a decision. I'm going to get outside. I may die out there, but I'm going to get outside. 
So I crawl across the grid work of the floor and make my way to that opening where I see the light. I made it out the door, and I thought to myself, I've, I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish. I made it outside. At least now I can breathe. I may die out here, but I can breathe.